April 20th, 1999, two teenage gunmen took the lives of 12 students and one teacher inside Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado. Today on KPRC 2 Plus Now, we honor those victims. to get down because there was gunshots and we all got down and we, we crawled out and we all ran just across the street and you could still hear the gunshots going off as we were going. This can't be happening to our school. I know, we don't. It's, oh, I don't know. You should be safe at school. It's just, you feel so helpless because we're all trying to do something and you know there's nothing you can do to bring them back. We still remember, the whole country remembers, especially Columbine, it, you know, it's, you know, we are Columbine, the whole country is. Today, mass shootings have escalated to a record pace in the U.S., with at least 162 already reported this year. Columbine became a blueprint of sorts for school shooters, giving them a playbook for how to pull off an assault on a place that's supposed to be safe. This is why we're dedicating time to talk about it this morning on KPRC 2 Plus Now starting with a conversation I had with Columbine's retired principal about that horrifying day 24 years ago. April 20th, 1999, when you hear that date, what runs through your mind? Oh, well, it was one of the worst days of my life, a day in which my life uh, changed forever. Uh, at times, it's hard to believe it's gonna be 24 years and uh, but it, it unfortunately, it defines our community, but it really doesn't signify what a great community Columbine is. And I coined a phrase early on, a time to remember and a time for hope. And I think Columbine does that. Uh, we will always remember our beloved 13 who lost their lives and everyone who was so deeply impacted. But Columbine does offer hope. And I can share with you today that I truly believe our community is stronger today than what it was prior to the event happening. And so many things happened that day that I can't explain. I just have to accept. I was a type of principal and just a little bit of history. I taught at Columbine and coached at Columbine for many, many years. And then all of a sudden I was approached to get a, an administrative license to become a principal. And it was tough for me to leave the classroom and coaching, but I was completing my third year as principal. And one of the things, the thing that I loved about the principal's job and is the relationships with the kids and the students. And, and I made it a promise that I was never going to be that principal that was in the office that the kids did not know who I was. And so the reason I'm saying that is probably out of 175 days, I met with our students for a lunch. I'm down in the cafeteria. Well, that day I was not in the building early on. I Our students, some future business leaders of America were getting awards and they wanted me to be there. So I was there. So I'm late getting back to Columbine. And so I'm looking for a staff member who student taught at Columbine. He was a one-year contract, Kiki Leba. And he said, uh, I was looking to him because I was going to hire him. Welcome to the Columbine family. Well, I couldn't find him. So he walks into my office right when a lunch is starting. So he sits down. I'm getting ready to give him the whole welcome to Columbine rebels for life. And to this day, and I just saw Kiki yesterday, I don't know if I ever offered him a contract. Now, he's still working at Columbine, but before we could have that discussion, my secretary comes running and the door's shut and she face plants. And she opens the door and I knew something was wrong. She said, Frank, there's been reports of gunfire and bombs exploding. And in my mind, this is not registering. I've been there for 20 years. I could count on two hands the number of fistfights we have. It was a perfect school. We had kids coming from other school districts to be a part of this great school. And then when I came out of my office, my worst nightmare became a reality. I just sprinted towards a gunman. And I remember so vividly, it just slowed down, but the gunman had a long rifle and the uh, barrel of the gun looked about the size of the cannon. And I just heard those shots going and glass breaking behind me. 
And people said, why? Why would you run towards a gunman? One reason and one reason only. Um, some of my kids were in trouble. I had about 25 girls that were coming out of the locker room to go to a physical education class outside. And they were just in the crossfire. And I knew I had to protect them. So I'm running down and the girls are saying, Miss Papa D, Papa D, what's going on? I said, we got to go. We got to go. I pull on the gymnasium doors and it's locked. The gunman is coming around the corner. The girls are screaming, praying, Papa, save us, Papa, save us. I literally had about 25 to 30 keys on a key ring. First key, I reached in, stuck in the door on the first try. I got the girls in, went out and got the police and they protected me as I went and got the girls. And then we went over to... Uh, Clement Park, which was where everything was mobilizing. And I worked with the police that day for the rest of the day and then ended up at Leewood Elementary, which was a reunification center at that point. Unfortunately, what I witnessed that day, I was never prepared for. I don't care how many degrees training you have, never prepared for because you never expect it to happen. And one of the things when I go out and reach out to these communities, the first thing they tell me is I can't believe it happened here. And if you would have asked me, you know, almost 24 years ago, I would have said, no, it doesn't happen here other places. But unfortunately, it continues to happen. According to the Washington Post, they have a, uh, a log of shootings across the country. And since Columbine, they report there have been 277 school shootings in this country. Close to 350,000 students in the U.S. have experienced gun violence while at school. As the retired principal of Columbine High School. When you hear these stats today, 24 years later, does that upset you? It upsets me, but I refuse to give up hope. But the one thing that I think we need to mention is we continue to hear about these school shootings, but how many have been stopped because of things we have in place now that weren't in place when you were growing up and all the different things that we're looking at now is protection because that does not necessarily make the airwaves, you know, or social media. Another school shooting was stopped because we had school resource officers or we had safe to tell an anonymous tip line. And I think we can't forget that. We got to continue to give up because they're all of our kids. It doesn't matter. Colorado, Texas, Florida, they're all of our kids. How long were you uh, principal after? I was principal 15 years after, and the reason being, originally, I made a decision that I, I, and I asked the staff and I asked the parents, let's stay together for three years until the freshman class graduated, which was 2002. And so I made that commitment. I said, you know, during tough times, families come together. And, but after that, I said, we do whatever we need to do. And so I was planning on staying three years and then I, you know, moving to possibly another school or central administration. And this is not for everyone, but one of the things that has really influenced me is I'm a person of faith. And I was really questioning my faith uh, that night. The priest, uh, where I'd been a member of the parish, Father Ken Leone called me down. And I said, Father, I can't. I'm struck. He said, please come down. So I walk into the church and in the sacristy, there must have been about 1,200 people. So he called me up on the altar along with some of my students that were part of the youth group, along with some of my staff members. And he whispered something. He said, Frank, you should have died that day, but God's got a plan. And then he whispered, uh, Proverbs 16, 9, he said, in his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his death. And he said, you're going to fall. You're going to be punched, you're, you know, figuratively, but there's going to be, he's going to be there to pick you up. So all of a sudden, I'm thinking I'm going to leave Columbine. You know, I got to make an announcement coming up. And I kept hearing those words resonate that I got to rebuild the community to help others. And I said, I have not done that in the three years. And so that's when I went out and made a commitment. I said, I'm going to stay as principal until every kid who was in the elementary school and middle school that day, I was their principal and given their diploma. And so I was getting ready to retire in 2012. And a parent says, we need to meet. We need a meeting right now. I said, okay, now what's going on? And they said, Mr. D, you can't retire. And I said, no, I made that commitment. They said, you don't understand. My kid was in the first year of a two-year preschool program. So you need to stay a couple more years. And I said, I will do it. We'll make it 15 years. So when I left, kids that were entering Columbine High School weren't even born. So I, I upheld that commitment that, you know, with the priest whispered in my ear. Time after time, we hear from uh parents of survivors we hear of parents of victims sometimes we hear from survivors within schools that experience gun violence 
we hear from faculty and staff. Um, we don't very often hear from principals, and I know you have used your experience from that day and the days that followed and the platform that you have to make a difference among principals who experience gun violence. Why don't you tell me about what it is that you've done? Yes, it all started back a few days after Columbine. I received a phone call from Bill Bond, and he was the principal at Heath High School at Paducah, where they had a school shooting. And he was part of the National Association of Secondary School Principals. And he said, Frank, here's who I am. You don't even know what you need. And, but keep my number. And I'm thinking, gosh, okay. And I didn't. I mean, it was just trial and error. Every day was a new experience. So I would call him and he would help me. What do we do when we go in back into the building? What do we do for our graduation, which was a month away? And I can remember thinking, and I was so naive, thinking, I hope that I never have to make a phone call like Bill had made to me. Well, unfortunately, I was way off on that one because I can remember having to make my first phone call. It was in, uh, I think, February of 2000. There was a school shooting in California, and I remember reaching out to the principal. And from that point on, every other shooting, I would call and just say, and it's not because it's Frank DeAngelis, it's because Columbine High School. And I would just call this as, if you need any support, here's my number. And usually within 24 hours, the principals would call me. And when I made the statement that I know what you're feeling, they're saying, yeah, you do. You were there. And so it was in 2018, uh, the head of uh, NAS, uh, National Association of Secondary School Principals, Greg Wapple, said, Frank, I'm thinking of starting something called the Principal Recovery Network. And we would like you to organize because we know you're reaching out to these principals. And so we got together and there are 20, I think about 22 of us from schools in which there's been gun violence, uh, shootings and things of that nature, it includes superintendents and principals. So we met in Washington, D.C. And I remember the first time we were all in the room together and they said, I remember receiving your phone call, Frank, and we opened up. Uh, they, we opened up to each other. So it was last year. We've been working on something called the Principal's Recovery Guide, and Greg Johnson and Elizabeth Brown facilitated that, but we put this guide together from experiences, like what do you do with the media? What do you do when you re-enter school? What do you do with the remembrance? And so we did last summer, all the principals met me at Columbine High School, we met there for two days, and I talked about my experience, and then the next day we did a, a national re press release about this guide. And so that's one of the things we're doing now. And just recently, uh, we had a school shooting at Denver East, which is within the Denver area, and then received phone calls from what's happening in Nashville. And we reach out to help these people, communities heal. My last question for you, sir. Uh, principals who might need help, might need resources, how can they go about connecting with you or the network to get those resources? If they go to the Principal's Recovery Network, it has our email addresses, it can make a phone call, and immediately we'll get in contact with them. The important message is you're never in this journey alone. And one important message, if I can share with the, the viewers, is something you're never prepared for. And unfortunately, as principals, as school people, we feel the need to take care of everyone else. But if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able help others. And when I have these conversations with all the principals and superintendents and staff members, I said, what are you doing to take care of yourself? Because you put everyone else's needs. That's who we are as educators. But if I did not get into counseling immediately, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you and being able to help others. And we thank Frank for taking the time to speak with us. Columbine was the deadliest mass shooting at a U.S. high school until February 14th, 2018, when a student opened fire at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in South Florida.